This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. On a peaceful moonlit night on that warm September of 1763, as the country folk of the Isle of Wight slept soundly in their beds, a small boat slipped unnoticed up a narrow, winding creek to a secret rendezvous. But disaster lay ahead for its crew of smugglers, for shortly after landing they were ambushed by the greedy men of the revenue service. In the darkness and confusion, Mark the cabin boy fled into the night from the revenue men's greed with 40 diamonds in a small canvas bag yet to no avail for he too was slain. However, this story does not end at his death. Vowing that no further evil should arise from the stones, Mark's spirit scattered them across the face of the island and departed to regions beyond the experience of mortals. Many have come to the island seeking the hidden stones, but few have been able to unravel their secrets. Hello cave dwellers, a snippet there in the intro from the subject of today's video, it's this Spirit of the Stones game. A game designed for when a simple game over screen or congratulatory message just isn't enough for the player. Yes, this is a real life treasure hunt set on the Isle of Wight just off the south coast of England. The hunt ran from 1983 through to 1993 and although it originally came out as a book only, it was published in this package with a game by Commodore. Just look at the size of it, it's bigger than my not unsubstantial head. <laughs> There's a lot to tell today, uh, including why I'm comparing it to Atari's ET, and that story will be told with the help of David Pleasance, former head of Commodore UK, and the author himself, John Worsley. Let's find out some more. Well, if the size of the box didn't get your attention in 1984, then the promise of a real diamond talisman and cash prizes surely would when you saw this on the shelves in the store. It's a Commodore 64 game and mine is the floppy disk edition with the price sticker still on it of a whopping £14.99. And it's published by Commodore themselves by appointment of Her Majesty the Queen. And it bears the Commodore 64 gold medallion badge, an honour issued by Commodore to themselves. Well done Commodore. Thank you Commodore. Good job. The idea then is that if you solve the clues and riddles in the book, written by author and artist John Howard Worsley, which is set on the Isle of Wight, then real prizes could be yours. For each sale, 50p is added to the prize fund, up to a maximum of £1 million, which is split into 50 shares. On solving the clues and identifying the locations of the talisman, you could post your answer in, or of course you could travel to find the hidden talisman and dig them up yourselves on the island. 41 were hidden, and each was set with a diamond. If you were smart enough to find one and present the talisman, or explain how you solved the clues, then you were entitled to one of the 50 shares of the prize fund. But if you found the 41st, the Great White Eye Talisman, with a diamond reportedly worth £12,000 in it, and deciphered its secret message, then you got 10 shares, which equates to £200,000, if the prize fund was at its maximum. To put that into some kind of context, it was more than four times the average house price in the UK in the 1980s. Quite the prize if sales should take the prize pot to those dizzy heights. The treasure hunt would run until all the talisman were found or until December the 1st 1993, which ever came first. I was lucky enough to exchange some messages with author John Worsley who sent me this extract from his book, The Exploded Illustrator, in which he describes the deal with Commodore. Commodore UK bought the book and game rights for £100,000 to be divided 50% for the game designers and 50% for the book partners. We had forfeited the rights to continue selling the book, but we would get a 50p royalty on each game book package sold. A factor to boost the value of the treasures had included a royalty fund of 50p per book to be divided between the successful Spirit of the Stone Seekers at the end of a 10 year period. This fund was to be honoured. We had offloaded many thousands of hardback first edition books to Commodore UK, keeping some back for possible future developments. At first all seemed well, especially when Commodore UK employed a publicity firm to promote the new game and book package. Commodore UK were confident. They immediately produced a softback second edition of Spirit of the Stones and booked a London Fleet Street venue for a champagne breakfast launch of their package. If we take a look inside the box, we can see exactly why it's so big. 
There's the hardback book by John Worsley, which is stuffed full of cryptic imagery, runes, and the story of Mark the Cabin Boy, whose spirit spread the talisman across the island, having escaped the tax man but at the cost of his own life, a passage of which we heard in the intro to this video. And of course, I've got the game here on floppy disk, which was created by Ian Gray and Lee Brain. Lee's development credits are limited, but Ian is credited on such titles as the Dizzy series of games and as a map designer on Cannon Fodder 2, so he's made something of a career for himself in the industry. Now it's important to note that the game is not at all necessary to solve the mystery. The book was released in 1983 on its own and then Commodore released the game in 1984 bundled with the book. So while clues in the game may assist you, it's not strictly required to find those talisman. Commodore no doubt was hoping that the Spirit of the Stones would create the same frenzy as Kit Williams' book Masquerade did in 1979. Williams' book gripped a nation hunting for a golden hair, hidden somewhere in Britain, and hundreds of thousands of armchair treasure hunters tried to decipher the fiendishly hard clues and unearth the hair. A winner to Masquerade was declared in 1983, the same year as the release of Spirit of the Stones. The chap comes to the phone. Hello, Kit. Hello. Oh, I feel terribly ill. I got a bad cold, you see. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's supposed to be jumping up and down on the other end of the phone. So I said, you're right. The jaw's in the... You, you've got it. It's in the right place. Oh, have I? Uh, what, it's, it's buried where I said it was? Yes. Oh, I can't, I can't go out digging today. I've, I've, you know, I'm, I've got a bad cold. So I said, well, uh, let us know when you've dug it up, will you? I dug a rather large hole, I might add. It was eight foot long, about two foot six across, and about three foot deep. Fair amount of work. Yes, a whole night. A whole night. But in 1988, it was discovered that the winner's name, Ken Thomas, was a pseudonym of Dougal Thompson, who had a business partner who was the boyfriend of the author's former girlfriend. And the Sunday Times, who broke the story, alleged that she managed to get the location out of author Kit Williams and reveal it to her new love interest. You were lucky, really, weren't you? Very lucky. My dog was the one. Without my dog, I don't think I'd have bothered. Did you, did you enjoy the whole process? Oh, yes, very much. On reflection, yes. But now you don't like the publicity? No. No. Not only did Thompson win the prize under spurious circumstances, he also released his own game named Hair Razor on the label Hairsoft, with business partner John Gard in 1984. It gave the promise of a £30,000 prize and a mystery which could be solved entirely on the computer. And it wasn't the only one, other games too wanted in on the treasure hunt frenzy, with Pie Mania being the first example I can find, released in 1982. This game offered a golden sundial worth £6,000, and that was won in 1985. And of course there were games with prizes for completing them first, that wasn't uncommon, but they lacked the treasure hunt aspects of Hair Razor, Pie Mania or Spirit of the Stones. So in 1984 when Commodore released Spirit of the Stones, armchair treasure hunts were extremely fashionable, and it would seem there was treasure to be had in cashing in on the craze. The book then is littered with clues and riddles, as well as a runic alphabet. You need to decipher that to progress, and the author has since released the solution to all of the riddles, which in itself still needs a lot of deciphering to understand, but I've included a link in the description if you want to go down that rabbit hole and see how to solve the whole book. If not, I won't put any spoilers here today. What I'm interested in though is how the game fits in with the book. As it turns out, it's an added extra to the book really. Four talisman had already been discovered using the book alone before the game was even released. The game then reflects the goals of the book in that it's set on the Isle of Wight and you have to search for the same diamond encrusted talisman across the virtual island. Each diamond you find in game reveals part of an ancient riddle, and that riddle won't lead you to a prize, but it will help you to decipher the meaning of the riddle of the runes, which you'll also need to have discovered in the book itself. The game's reward then is simply an extra clue in solving that riddle, and we can see from this slip of paper the previous owner has had a good try at piecing together the clue. We've got the words runes, the key, an unfinished word, and then for every pattern break. Cryptic indeed. The game itself is really quite ruthless to play, I struggle to make it through a single location, and there are 21 to make it through to discover all 40 diamonds. It's certainly a lot harder than it looks. At the top of the screen you can see that line of 40 diamonds, each hiding a letter, and if you should manage to collect one then a letter is revealed. 
all the while avoiding ghosts, banshees, manticores, demons, and all manner of flying and falling things. I guess you could compare the location scenes to Jet Set Willy in style, with a map view to travel between locations. It's far from an amazing game, and to add to matters, you need a certain amount of stamina to endure the Sid rendition of Night on the Bald Mountain, which is well composed, but after the 50th loop it gets somewhat repetitive, and is a constant reminder that I've spent many a night on Bald Mountain. As the talisman were discovered, the author would place a plaque in its place to let other hunters know they were on the right track, but a little too late. And to encourage people to visit the Isle of Wight, the game included a Diamond Time holiday offer in collaboration with the Isle of Wight Tourist Board. I guess they were hoping for busloads of treasure hunters to descend en masse. While it may not have proven as popular as they'd hoped, according to Commodore Horizon magazine in April 1985, a cult of rune code addicts was formed by those whom hunting the treasure had become a way of life, and runic graffiti appeared on the island. Although I've found no evidence of that outside of the article, it may just be a little bit of shameless self-promotion. It is ironic though that the game which involved digging for treasure should meet the fate that it did. In much the same way that the infamous E.T. on the Atari 2600 did, albeit in smaller quantities. And I think the best person to explain this is David Pleasance, who was working at Commodore at the time, and here's what he had to say on the matter when I discussed it with him. The truth of the matter is I didn't even know of the software's existence. Remember I joined Commodore in June of 83, and very shortly after we moved to Corby, it was after then that when they decided they wanted to, to leave Corby, and I had to clear all the inventory. And there happened to be several thousand pieces of this game called Spirit of the Stones. I got in touch with somebody that I had heard of, but not, not really met before, it was a guy called Lou Fine. I guess you'd call him a, an East End Barra boy. He was one of these guys who bought a redundant stock and sold it wherever, whenever, however. And I invited him along and, I mean, there was hundreds of thousands of pieces of software because Commodore was never very good at anything to do with software. The only success I think that they had was international soccer, which, um, you know, was a big success for them. But anyway, I was, I was told, get rid at, at any cost. Anyway, basically, I tried to get to Lou and, and, and succeeded. He took nearly everything that we had in the place, um, if the price was right. And I just kept making a, I kept making a bigger and better deal the more he took. But uh, when it came to the Spirit of the Stones, because of the box, uh, the packaging was pretty attractive. Um, and he could see that it's the sort of thing I think he could envisage being sold in, on, in market stalls because it was, um, you know, very impressive packaging. He, he made me an offer. I think it was something like two pounds a box. And when I looked into it, because obviously I had to... Uh, see what copyrights and anything were involved, what um, if there were any royalties or anything. And that's when I, to my horror, discovered that the, this deal had been done with the Isle of Wight Tourist Board. They were entitled, I'm pretty certain it was five pounds per box sold. So I, I ma managed to track them down and rang them up. And I said, look, we're getting rid. Uh, everything has got to go. Um, I've been offered two pounds for it. Um, uh, how about you take a pound and I take a pound and we call it square? And to my shock and horror, they absolutely refused, point blank refused. And they said, no, it's five pounds or nothing. And I said, well, you know what that means? And they said, yeah, but you won't do that. And I said, what's this space? I said, if you don't accept the deal, then, then we will destroy them because it, it will cost us four pounds a box to sell them uh, to, at two pounds and give you your five. It doesn't make any sense, you know. So uh, anyway, the bottom line is that this is exactly what I had to do. Um, so we had two lawyers, two independent lawyers, who came along with cameras. We had a, a JCB digger, and we dug this massive big hole, and we, we tipped in all of the Spirit of the Stones, and we buried them. And they were signed off by the lawyers, and we sent that to the Isle of Wight Tourist Board, and, and they were shocked, but hey, you get what you get. And and, and to be honest with you, people who, who had written the, a game, because it was it was like 99% of his games. People had written the game, if we could give them 25p and for something that had been dead for five years or four years or three years, they were very happy. That was only this one instance, and, and, and I just thought it was a good story to put into the book 
because it, it just shows you there are such different people in the world and how they react to different things in different ways. So, as we heard from David, in much the same way as Atari's E.T. ended up buried in the New Mexico desert, the fate of Spirit of the Stones lay in the ground. What though of author John Worsley's memories of the game's fate? Here's what he shared with me on the subject. Commodore UK had overreached in their ambition, and they had a warehouse full of second edition book game packages, and with no intention of further promotion, they asked if I'd like to buy them all to knock down price. I told them my situation. In the end, I received a phone call from the top man stating that if I'd like to clear their warehouse, I could have the lot for nothing. This would amount to many lorry loads. It was an opportunity, but I was in no position to entertain such an endeavour. The entire load was taken to a landfill site and buried. Now, the above account is the truth of the matter. I have read on the internet that someone connected with the original book publishers tried to knock down the price of the stock when offered, and rather than be blackmailed, the load was destroyed in the method already described. I never tried that tactic, and I was offered the entire stock for nothing. This was a sad end to the computer game, but the treasure hunt continued. While Commodore saw no value in the package, the treasure hunt was still very much in progress, and 19 talisman are still undiscovered to this day, which Worsley calls the lost talisman of the Spirit of the Stones. But the grand prize, the Great White Eye, was indeed won. Originally hidden in the roots of a tree in Beach Copse near God's Hill, a great storm which battered the UK in 1987 uprooted the tree, and the prize now stood 12 feet high in the air. John retrieved the prize and placed it in the custody of the trustees of the treasure fund, and it could now only be won by whoever deciphered the final riddle. It was brothers Malcolm and Colin who had been working on the puzzle for five years when they finally solved the riddle. They'd also discovered some of the other talisman during those five years, but now the great white eye was theirs, and their share of the prize fund, which you'll recall was 10 shares or 20% of the pot, and for them that amounted to £16,000, making the total prize pot size £80,000. 50p from each sale went into that pot, remember, which would suggest the total sales of the book was around 160,000. While it no doubt made the brothers very happy, it certainly wasn't a money spinner for Commodore or for the author, and it certainly wasn't a good time for an unnamed claimant who John reveals made a correct claim just one week after the brothers, having also dedicated five years of his life to solving the riddle. Spirit of the Stones then really didn't manage to recreate the hysteria or the revenue of Masquerade. It wouldn't be the end of the UK's obsession with treasure hunts though, as was most evident in our weekly dose of Annika Rice charging around the country in the TV show Treasure Hunt. This ran from 1982 through to 1989, and was revived for a short spell in the 90s. But gamers, they were much happier in the warmth of their rooms, zapping aliens rather than digging holes. Who knows then if real world treasure hunts will ever catch on again as a video game genre. Perhaps through the use of VR or augmented reality, it will happen and we'll all get hooked. What I do know for certain is that David still refuses to tell me the location of the hole in which the many copies of Spirit of the Stones reside. I hope you enjoyed today's story. If you have any memories of this game or similar, please leave a comment, I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, thank you for watching and take care. So where did you say you buried the game, David? Um, it's a place called Somewhere. But it was in Hampshire, right? Yeah, we're very close. Wiltshire? Uh, yeah, very, very close indeed. I've got £10 here with your name on it, David, if you tell me. <laughs> that, that I'm afraid that won't do it. That won't pay for the map. OK, I've got £20 and a bag of fun-sized Mars bars. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, sadly, I'm diabetic, so, so sugar doesn't tempt me. <laughs> I won't tell anyone, David. No, no, I'm sworn to secrecy, as were the lawyers, and um, it's something I'll, I will take to the grave with me. I will find them, David. Okay, bye now. I will find them. <laughs>